Welcome to Law Subscribed. This is your dedicated news source for all things subscriptions in the law. My name is Matthew Kerbis. I'm the subscription attorney, and I believe subscriptions can help bridge the access to justice gap and incentivize attorneys to modernize and scale their practice like never before. On this show, I interview lawyers ditching the billable hour and experts who can help attorneys move beyond billing time. Thanks to my sponsors, 650 and Gavel. Links to both in the show notes. More on them later. And use the code Law Subscribed when signing up. You get 10% off, and it supports the show. The best way to support the show is to share it with someone you know. This podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes only, and nothing said is legal, ethical, or financial advice. Without further delay, here's the episode. I'm thrilled to have with me today another attorney cut from the same cloth, Mark Snyderman. Welcome to the podcast, Law Subscribed. Thanks. Glad to be here. So I found out about you through the Lawline podcast, Lawyers Who Lead, which at the time of publication of this episode, my episode will probably be live, though at the time of recording, I haven't been on the show yet, but you've been on the show and I'm usually the first lawyer on a podcast that's talking about the subscription model. And I'm, I'm actually happy. I'm not going to be the first (laughs) guest that they have that's talking about ditching billing time and all that. So, so go ahead and, and just give a little introduction for my audience, if you won't mind. Sure. I, I, I like to say that I'm kind of a hybrid of a, of a business attorney and a businessman. Uh, my career has kind of spanned both because I started out as a corporate securities lawyer in Manhattan, uh, went in-house after about 18 months, uh, and then spent five years in-house at one of the cable companies back in the nine, late nineties, early two thousands when they were going, when they were all going public and then ended up at a engineering and IT services firm that did mostly work for the department of defense and ended up being the COO of that company for about 10 years. Mm-hmm. So I grew that company ran that company. I was also the general counsel, so I gave myself advice, which was just awesome. You know, it's nothing, nothing like being able to answer some questions and, and say yes. So, and then I decided to leave there and start a private practice. And that's kind of, and I started the practice with the intent that I wanted to try to fix some things that I saw wrong with the legal profession, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's why I have the podcast, right? So that's why I'm so glad to have you here. The, the, the company now is Outside General Counsel Solutions, or OGC, which is a Correct. nice branding. I gotta say, I, I gotta say, I always, yeah. I'm, I'm always a sucker for good branding. In even the OG thing, depending on who your potential, you know, clients are. That's like, right. You, yeah, you're, you know, the OG. We're the, we're the OG counsel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, so I mean, right on your, you know, it doesn't necessarily say subscription, but right on your website, it says fixed and predictable cost. Yeah. Right. So, like, this is one of these things that. But fractional legal needs is like, this is key. This is the, the term that's been blowing up even outside of legal, you know, fractional HR, fractional CFO, mm-hmm. fractional legal. Why not? Why can't that work too? So with your business background, though, I'm curious to know, like, like, how did you come to this model as a way to conduct? Yeah, uh, you know, it's service? interesting. I'll give you the, yeah, I'll give you the story of why I, when I was leaving and looking at, you know, the landscape and saying, you know, I was leaving the company. I was like, well, what am I going to do? You know, I knew I wanted to do some entrepreneurial ventures. I had some investments I was making, but I was like, well, I can make money. And, you know, I'm a lawyer. I, I can always hang a shingle and try to do some of this again. It's been a long time since I was a private in private practice, but I could figure this out. And, you know, when I set up the shop, I was basically like, well, you know, what's wrong with the profession right now? Because, you know, I, I had been hiring a lot of attorneys as a GC. I hired a lot of outside firms that come in and do work. They were charging a fortune. And all I kept saying was, well, any client I really want to work with is going to be small and medium sized businesses. How are they going to afford this? You know, and what's missing? So I use this one story as an example. So when I was in, when I first started practicing, you know, you're in the late nineties, we had all fashion clients. We were in the garment district and, you know, it was just an interesting time. And we had a, a really big client. Jill Stewart was the, was the brand. She's a phenomenal brand. And she was looking for a new, a new store down in Soho. And she called the senior partner in me and asked us to come down and negotiate the lease and look at the space with them. And I remember thinking, you know, when I was going to start the firm, would anybody actually call their attorney to come look at space and negotiate a lease on site? And I kept thinking to myself, nobody's going to do that. There's no, like, how would you ever, why would you, you couldn't afford to do that. It makes no sense. Right. But the differential in negotiating at the site and actually not negotiating until there's already a lease drawn up and you've been handed it is like, it's, it's an extreme difference in what the value you can add. Right. And I said, 
how can I get to a point where that's something that somebody would do with me? And that's when I thought about, well, if I made it subscription and they didn't have to think about it, you would put yourself in a position where they would say, that's somebody that would add value to me. I'm going to call them and have them come with me. And it, it took five years because nobody was actually moving spaces that I, none of my clients were actually moving. The first client that was moving space, I never asked them, I never said a word to them. They picked up the phone and called me and said, hey, we're moving space. Can you meet us at this building? We're going to look at a couple of spaces. Can you come with us and talk to the landlords? So it does work. Yeah, yeah. I've never been asked to go to a site. I don't know that I would be able to offer that because the prices I'm charging <laughs> are so low that like I got to be at my desk to do the work and to, to yeah. do, do all that stuff. But uh, but some of my earliest work when I went solo about two years ago at time of recording was uh, was lease work for, uh, okay. for small businesses yeah. that, you know, they, they would have never hired a lawyer at the billable hour. I don't know if they've ever hired a lawyer before. I was like the first lawyer they've ever hired to help them yeah. with these commercial leases. You know, I was representing the tenant. And and it's just one of these things where I'm, I, you know, I I really help them dodge a lot of bullets because these landlords yeah. take advantage of unsophisticated parties, right? Um, of course. Yeah, yeah, but but that's that's it. That's a need. I think there, there's serious need there. And you know, if, if one of my higher ticket paying subscribers clients will would ask me to come look at another space with them, oh, absolutely, I will be there. Yeah. Right. I I will definitely be there. I think that that's a great example. Though it still begs the question, Mark, uh, I have to I have to wear my journalist hat sometimes. And that sure. is like still, though, like, you know, did, did you have a dream and you were like subscriptions the way was your the business that you were in house at? Was that was that a subscription business? Like still, why subscription? Like, like, how no, the, the, the business that I was in was really a T&M business. I mean, it was, you know, I guess the, the best phrase is ass in seats, right? It's, you know, we were we were a government contractor, right? You're putting people in the government seats and they're doing the work. Yeah. So it's all so, T&M kind of work. You know, did you read books, listen to podcasts? You know, you said you were an investor. Were you investing in SaaS companies? Like, how did you come to the SaaS was definitely the model that I was looking at, right? And saying it's, you know, I think there's a, there's a fractional, you know, there's a use of fractional resources that everybody can, can use. And especially, you know, it's when, you know, when I started, it was, so I started the, I started 2017, 2016 or 2017. 2016, I think is when I started the firm. And it really was that time when you started to look at and say, where are people putting their money? What are they buying? And everybody was starting to buy SaaS products, but nobody really knew what that meant, right? You were kind of buying them and just kind of willy nilly saying, hey, this one's 40 bucks a month, this one's 100 bucks a month, whatever it is. And I just kept thinking there was a way to do legal like a startup. You know, the first piece was it has to be, more, it has to be done like a startup. You have to kill your over, you have to crush out the overhead. You have to go to, you have to go to virtual. And if not virtual, you can have an office, but it can't be an office, right? It's gotta be like just a room, right? Where you can store some files and have some stuff and nobody really cares. Nobody. And it was pre COVID, but still the same concept. My concept was always, if I can get clients that wanted to work with me and were willing to pay a monthly fee. I would actually go, I'd rather go to the client's site and spend a day there a week or every other week, a half a day. I would say, I would tell clients when I first started, just give me a conference room and I'll come in for a half a day on Wednesday. And I said, well, do you want to set up meetings? I said, no, I don't want to set up any meetings. I just want to be at your office. I want yeah. to be there and I want to talk because I'll walk around and people will talk to me and I'll get to know the HR people and I'll get to know the accounting people. And then what's going to happen is they're going to call me and you're not going to care that they're calling me directly because it's all in the monthly fee. Right. Right. And that's the differential, right? And it's getting it, you know, you would say to the CEO or the COO, you're going to get it out of your hands. Right now, legal, the only person that will touch legal is you because you can't afford to let anybody else do it because you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah. The fees are and, too crazy. And what I've even come to find is there are things that come up with these you know, with these, these, you know, larger business, but like small, when you're looking at businesses like yeah. that have HR departments and accounting departments, you know, you, you might be looking at, you know, it, almost a hundred or over a hundred person company. Right. So still a small company, maybe compared to, you know, Microsoft and Apple, but exactly, you know, a lot of people. And so what I find is for like the executives, the CEO, who's usually the one who's hiring us, you know, outside counsel, they you know, they're not even worried about some of the things that the HR department are bringing to us. Like, you know, some employee got sued personally when it should have been the company kind of a thing. 
Like that, yeah. you know, the CEO doesn't want to worry about something like that. The C-suite executives, they don't care. But like one part of the value that we're able to provide is now the VP of HR doesn't need to go to the the execs about it. Exactly. The execs, they come right to us and that's the value. But but maybe like how do you handle then? How how have you handled like maybe like letting the CEO, like like letting the, the person who's looking at the, the, the monthly legal fee going out, yeah, you know, I handled all these things for HR. Yeah, I'm not going to bother mm-hmm. you with it, obviously, right? It's like, how, how have you handled those kinds of things? I mean, it's, they're, they're kind of, they're actually pretty natural conversations, I would say, with, with the CEO that, you know, let, up, let, me, let me do what I do and let me help your people and they're going to be happy. And you can get all the feedback you need from them on how I helped out and what I did. And if you want me to talk to you about it, I will. But, you know, you can have in, these internal conversations are going to pop up and, you know, they get to say, hey, you know, I talked to Mark and he fixed that. He fixed that thing for the for the one employee. It's real. It was really, really helpful. Yeah. And you didn't have to deal with it. Right. But you look like a hero because you brought me in. Yeah. So so I, I really want to unpack like how you got started, because we have yeah. a lot of we have a lot of listeners who are who skew not necessarily younger, but like less experienced because we have non-traditional attorneys who like didn't go to law school right out of college. Maybe they had another career, but they're still like young lawyers, right? They're still like less experienced lawyers. And maybe they want to go solo or they want to start a subscription practice inside their firm or or something like that. So that's what I want to try to unpack. So at least on LinkedIn, it says you've been doing it for seven years. Is that when you started? When you you went, you started it right away. I started the the firm, but you know, when I started, so it started out of Snyderman Law Group. Mm-hmm. Which was me, and I had, and I brought in an associate who was my de- my former deputy general counsel. I brought her over, and we started out together, just the two of us, with an ops person, kind of support. And you know, I started we we started out a subscription or a fixed fee, nothing else. Yeah. We weren't doing everything. If it wasn't a subscription, it had to be a fixed fee. And my my goal was really that that's all I would ever do. Mm-hmm. You know. Obviously, you know, I merged the firm last year into OGC Solutions and, you know, they're a much bigger practice. There's 20 attorneys. There's a lot of litigation work. There's, you know, work that doesn't really fit in the model, right? But the corporate side work and the OGC work, we're still maintaining it as full subscription. So there is some billable hour work that I have to do now. You know, mergers and acquisitions are really hard to do on a on a true fixed price. We're kind of doing... TNM not to exceed. We're we're we're, we're trying to fig- figure it out. We haven't gotten quite quite there yet. But on the day to day, monthly kind of the the day to day service, we have that down. Yeah, I I was asked on on some podcast. I can't remember which one it was. It might have been one of the answering legal ones. I've been on a lot of their podcasts lately. But it was some question around like like if attorneys want to like stop billing time, how do they like convince you know the other stakeholders at the firm to do subscription? And yeah. I, I said, it's going to be a heck of a lot easier to just leave and go start your own thing. <laughs> like, yeah. Like at the yeah, end of the it, day. it would be. It, it is it is a hard thing to, you know, to explain to, you know, traditional legal. And it, and it, and, and, and honestly, if the firm is too big, it can't really pivot and do it. Yeah. Because if you're not going to use a whole lot of tools and you're, and you're going to staff up the way lawyers typically like to staff up, the subscription model is going to be really, really difficult to handle. Right. I, I mean, look, the way that I approach M&A transactions, because I don't bill at all because it's just me, is I have a subscription add-on. And for me, okay. since my transactions are usually less than a million dollars, right? So like, yeah. there's not a lot of due diligence. In fact, like, I'll only do the due diligence on the contracts that are coming over anyway and letting my client know. Because I'm I, at this, at least at this stage of my career, I'm representing more buyers than sellers. So I'll right. let, I let my buyer client, you know, know some of the obligations. Do we actually want to acquire that or not? Like, like, you know, so, so, and, and there are very few types of contracts, like with like UPS franchises, it's like, okay, the Konica printer lease, you yeah. know, that kind of stuff. Like there's yeah. not a lot of due diligence. Simple stuff. Yeah. So, so at least right now on my website, it's like an $800 a month add-on fee. So whichever okay. level they're subscribed at, but, but I require my premier level subscribe. I require a hundred dollars a month minimum to get access to yeah. that subscription add-on. So my twenty dollars a month subscribers don't get access to that because what the hundred dollars a month subscribers get with me, the premier subscribers, is they're getting access to all of my calendar to schedule calls with me because we're going to need more time to chat with each other, more availability to get this transaction done. So really, I'm making nine hundred a month on an M and A transaction that you know might last from three to six months. 
So like, it's not yeah. a huge thing. They know exactly what it's going to cost. It's pretty profitable for me. And my client's getting a heck of a lot of work. And I could tell you with certainty when I was billing time, I would make twice as much money. But you know, after they buy that business, I want them to stay subscribed with me. And exactly. so I'm yeah. looking, I'm looking long-term. I could charge twice as much on a flat or recurring basis. And I know that it's reasonable because I used to charge that when I was billing time. But, but for me, just doing that, that temporary subscription add-on, as soon as the M&A negotiations start, you know, with that letter of intent, boom, that's, where we're going to start that $800 mm -hmm. a month on top of it. And as soon as we hit the closing table, it's done. So it's a temporary ad subscription add-on. That's how I've been handling the M&A transaction. Interesting. That's interesting. I, li I like the concept. Yeah, I mean, um, and for for the smaller deals, the less than a million dollar deals makes a lot of sense because they're 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 pretty cookie cutter overall. Yeah, uh, but, but even with there's like, always wrinkles, right? But you're yeah. you're in the business. That's well, always like the longer, difference. If it takes longer, then you're still getting the eight hundred a month or whatever it is yeah. commensurate with that type of of transaction. So if things are more complicated and it takes longer, you're still making more money because it's it's going to take another month for you to get it done. Right. And, and something else I found, because I interview a lot of people on the show, and, and in particular, Mark Stiving with Impact Pricing made some really good suggestions on a, on a couple of deals that like I had structured some unique pricing. And, and extrapolating from that, plus this M&A thing. So if I'm doing a, 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 you know, a multi-million dollar M&A transaction, I'm thinking maybe I charge whatever it is, X amount a month, but also there's a closing success fee. And it mm -hmm. goes down as time goes on. Because you want yeah. to incentivize to get to the closing yeah, you incentivize table. the close. Yeah. And then, and then, so, so, you know, certainly, you know, you could have something in the engagement that says, you know, maybe even after so many months, the monthly fee goes down to incentivize yeah. the closing because you want to align incentives between attorney and client. Right. But, but there should be, I think there's ways to do a combined subscription plus flat fee that you could totally ditch the billable hour, yeah. even on those complicated M&A transactions. I like the, I, I like the value base you know, billing. I, I like the concept of it a lot. Really interesting. Yeah. But, but you got to get, you got to get the other people on board, the partners at yeah. the firm now, right. To something like that yeah. and, and show them how with AI tools, you could get to the end result a heck of a lot faster to analyze like legal trained AI, which I've had a lot of guests on my show now who are yeah. founding those, those types of companies. I, I'm using them as a first pass, just as a first pass. I'm not relying a hundred percent on them but you could probably get to the closing table faster with these AI tools as they get better and better. They're the worst they're ever going to be. And when you switch over to this value-based pricing, you can make more money in less time. And why not? Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think you hit it right on the head. I mean, the, the, you can't be afraid of the tech that's coming. You got to adopt it and you got to be able to say, I'm going to go down this path. I'm going to adopt it. If it's getting you, I mean, you know, it's 80, 20 rule. If it got you 80% there, you're in a phenomenal place, right? Especially when you're not billing time. <laughs> yeah, you're in a phenomenal place. Yeah. 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 So, so Mark, just, just throwing it out there six months from now, a year from now, we'll have you back on the show and see how it's gone yeah. with trying to, yeah. try to move, move the partners over to that. But, but then I like, so that let's still, still stay focused then on before you, you merged. I'm curious to know, even back then. I mean, there's, yeah. there was pretty good automation tech back then, but you were, you hadn't had your own practice before. You weren't even, you know, traditionally practicing law. Nope. Like, where did you go? How the heck did you get started? Dude? <laughs> did you Google it? Did you go to a, a CLE? Like, what were the resources you went to to figure out how to do this thing? I kind of just did it. Just to be, I'm going to be honest with you. I just did it. I didn't yeah. really read up on any of it. I, I kind of figured, you know, I think I bought one of those, you know, how do you start your own law firm books? And you know, it tells you the normal stuff. And then I was like, okay, I kind of had, I mean, I had a good list of what I was going to need tools wise. And I yeah. said, well, if I have these tools and, you know, I kind of, you know, I had built a good business in and had a good reputation for building the business that I built and figured in the industry, I could go pull a couple clients and I pulled a couple clients and kind of just fell from, kind of just grew from there. But we, we hit or miss with a lot of stuff. I mean, we were trying so, you know, in terms of, you know, trying to go out and market and how are we going to get more clients and what were we going to go after, you know, you know, you swing and miss a bunch of times, but, you know, I got on to some, you know, I think the one place I got one really good client was, uh, I was doing volunteer work for bunker labs. I had come out of DOD work. Mm -hmm. So I'm always looking for veterans and anytime I can support veterans, that's a, that's those are charities that I want to be involved in bunker labs does, you know entrepreneurs, right? So veteran entrepreneurs trying to support them. And I got on a panel and the panel happened to be with, you know, 
it was all the big firms in Philly and me. And, you know, it was a good, it was great for me. Didn't yeah. work out well for them. Worked out great for me. Because, <laughs> you know, they're sitting there trying, you know, people are like, okay, that's great. You can, you can do all this, but how do I afford you? And then they come up with their, you know, well, you know, if you use our startup package, you know, and we raise funds, you know, you won't have to pay us until after the funds are raised. And I said, then you're going to take 40% of the raise. And what do they have left? <laughs> yeah. It's and like looked at the, me like, how dare yeah. you say that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, look, so, you know, long time seed or early angel investors know like all their money's going to legal, <laughs> like to yeah. get things set up. Yeah. Right. So it's just one of those things where what if it didn't have to? Right now, like it probably have to. how much quicker you could scale that business. Yeah. It was, um, you know, if you, you know, that's why I was like, whenever I, so I, I do, I got, I do some angel investing and advisory work. I'll do the legal for free. Yeah. I, I pick up their legal work for free because it's, you know, I'm just helping my own investment. Right. I'm, I don't, I don't leave my money going anywhere else, but you know, to where it should go, which is tech and people and marketing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and look, there's a there's a company called Hey Counsel, and I don't I know they've pivoted a few times, but at least the original okay. conceit was connect lawyers with startups to give them equity in exchange. Yeah, but you're getting equity because you're actually investing in them, and you're also doing yeah. the legal work for them. So, yeah. so this is a thing that like lawyers can ethically. I mean, I know there's a bunch of check boxes you got to check. Yeah, but they yeah. could ethically in exchange for equity in a startup, like do yeah. the original legal stuff. So and and um, they should. They should be doing it. Yeah. I mean, if you're, if you're not taking those kind of, you know, opportunities that are available in the market these days, you're missing out. And if you're a business lawyer and you're not going to take on, you know, some startups to help out, why would you not do that? You know, there's people who put, you know, millions on the street doing this. You don't have to put millions on the street. Just put some time into it. Right. Right. Lawyers have that. And it's very rewarding work. I also yeah. think, I also happen to think it's some of the most rewarding work I get to do. Yeah. You know, you're mentoring, you know, you, you, you get, you're in a position to mentor and help a business that's just getting started. You know, it could be young, it could be older, doesn't matter, but th th they need help. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you mentioned the getting clients thing, and I want to dive in a little bit more on that because yeah. it's one of these through lines where if you're in private practice, it doesn't matter what your business model is, and it doesn't matter what technology you're using or all these things or how big or small you are, you got to get the clients, right? It's like the number yep. one through line. Now that changes a lot depending on your business model and stuff. Like you just gave a great example of how since you were, and, and you're not necessarily going for uh, cheap prices, but you were clearly the most affordable or at least most predictably priced attorney on that panel that of course they're going with you. So distinguishing yourself on price is one of those ways you could do it when you have a unique business model like, like we do. Mm -hmm. But, but that only applies, in particular, what I found, to institutional clients who are used to paying billable time, right? Or they understand right. the, the unknowns around that and how it can be really, really expensive. And even sometimes they'd be willing to end up paying the same amount. They just want to know how much they're going to pay before they pay you. But have you found that it's, was, it's been easier to sell these institutional clients? Or have you been able to capture clients who maybe have never hired a lawyer before? You know, this latent legal market, this blue ocean, serving them. Yeah, I mean, I think that the blue oceans opened up a lot more since, you know, with, with four or five years worth of content that I put out, mm -hmm. you know, I put out, a, I put out a significant amount of content on LinkedIn. Like there's, there's a, there's, you know, 45 second videos of me pretty much every day. Wow. Right. Not, 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 that's not a joke. There's pretty much one every day that goes up and it costs me money and costs me a lot of time to invest in doing all that content generation. You know, a lot of it is because I think there's just a need for, you know, some pragmatic legal and business advice that's really straightforward that isn't BS. And as you can tell, I'm not really one to do that. <laughs> that's not really the way I am. And, but it has opened up like people that have never hired an attorney and they hear me talk and they say, you know, you're really think differently than uh, other attorneys that we've seen or that we think about when we think about attorneys. Yeah. Well, you know, let me know if you want your people to get a recording of th like this recording. <laughs> if they, yeah. if there's anything they find useful to chop up and put on LinkedIn, I'm happy to share it with with them. Yeah, so I'm sure they will. <laughs> let, let let me know, even though it's more for an, a lawyer audience. But you know, I'm sure yeah. there's things you've said that will be useful for your LinkedIn. Why not double, triple dip if you if you can, right? Exactly. Yeah, you um, have to. Yeah, for for volunteering though, even going back to that, I have found that I volunteer on four local boards in my community, and like I'm a virtual yeah. law firm, I can help people anywhere in the state of Illinois. 
but or I've even had clients transacting in Illinois from outside the state. But but like these volunteer organizations have brought in a lot of money to my firm. Yeah. And I'm like not even marketing there. I'm just involved with things I care about. I mean, one of them is the Chamber of Commerce. Right. So that's sort of yeah. everyone's there to get business. But but just doing things that you're passionate about, that you enjoy, yeah. you want to put good back into the world. I think that I just want to highlight that not only does it sound like it's worked for you, but it's working for me too. And so these are not the things that you think of when you think of traditional business development for a law firm, right? Um, are there any other things? Like what else have, are you doing? Obviously, the video content is huge. I listened to Lauren Lester's uh, podcast, A Different Practice, and she's a friend of the show. And she just had an episode that went live yesterday or today all about mm -hmm. how you need to do video for your law firm. It's like the best yeah, way you to, to get lead generation. So you, you're obviously doing that. That seems to be working for you. Like what else are you doing, especially in the early days? What did you do to get those clients? I particularly want to know the misses. They might be just unique to you, but if we could yeah. learn from them and avoid them. You know? I, I would say, you know, I, I, there, I thought networking was, I thought you had to go to all the networking events, right? I thought the networking events would be really big and would be really good for me. And, you know, I'm in the Philadelphia area. There's a lot of stuff around here, a lot of events. And I found that, you know, you would go to them, you'd meet, you know, 30, 40 people, you'd get 30, 40 business cards. You have, you know, 10 of those become a coffee or a lunch or something. And you spend your, and you find out that none of them are decision makers. And they're all just, you know, they're all technically BD people. And it's a complete and utter waste of time. Like they were just, I wasted a lot of time doing those kind of events when I found that the best way to do it was really hand to hand, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, you know, call people that, you know, and literally go meet them for coffee and say, here's what I'm doing. You know, anybody that might, that you think would be an interesting, you know, intro for me, I'd really appreciate it. And I do a very good job of, you know, connecting dots for other people. I make it a very big point to make sure that I have a really strong network. I think building your spheres of influence is super important, right? So do you have accountants? Do you have, they're not, in, and look, some of them are not very good referral partners. Accountants, insurance brokers, they tend to be terrible referral partners. Like they won't send anything back to you, but you can send stuff to them all day, but that's okay. Because building that, that, that pay it forward mentality will pay off in the end. And it won't come from them because it never does, <laughs> but it comes from people knowing that you're the person that will always connect and do things. And they call you back because they say, oh, you know, remember Mark, Mark actually helped me. He got me that person. He got me that person. And, you know, so having, so building the, that's, that's a network that you have to build as a solo. And even in, in, in a, in a firm, right. You need to have your group of people that you can refer out for whatever anybody comes up with. And that's part of the general counsel gig, right? Right. People call you because, you know, you know, people, right. And, oh, you're a trusted advisor. Even if you're not my trusted advisor, you're a trusted advisor to some people and you're, and I need to know who do I call for this particular work? I have them. I, but you know, that includes, you know, everything down to graphic designers, web developers, you know, you have some of everything that anybody could possibly need, have really good people around that you can refer out. And it definitely helps your brand. When I went solo, I pivoted from mostly litigation to a transactional only practice. I did not have a database of documents to automate. That's why a business and employment legal document database and automation tool like 650 is super useful. I can rely on the quality of the documents in 650's database since they're putting excellent legal minds to work curating and updating their documents and automations over time. When you're not billing by the hour, outsourcing and efficiency matters, and 650 can help you scale your practice to get high quality documents drafted in less time. Use the code law subscribed at 650. 50.com and when being onboarded to get 10% off. If you're not a business and employment attorney or you have your own documents that you'd prefer to use, then my next sponsor, Gavel, is the automation tool for you. Gavel allows you to build shareable, client-facing workflow and document automations. In other words, Gavel helps you create a legal practice where attorneys can monetize the value they bring clients in productized form and scale via subscriptions and flat fees. Use the code LAW subscribed at gavel.io to get 10% off an annual subscription. There's no one right way to automate and scale your practice, but with one or both of my sponsors, 650 and Gavel, you can take your subscription law firm to the next level. Links to both in the show notes. Now back to the show. Yeah. So Bill Jostin, who is on the podcast, who's with Thomson Reuters Institute, is really interested in the data. And one of the things we talked about on that episode, which should air before this one, is, is there's just not a lot of data on the subscription model. 
and, and mm-hmm. alternative alternative fees in general, like true alternative fees. You know, there have been like hourly caps and like other sorts of right. things, but that's not true alternative fees, right? No, so, not at all. So, so yeah. So anyway, we talked about the difficulties in it, and and because there's not a lot of data, but like I, this is anecdotal, but I'm going to corroborate one of the, another thing you just said, which was that like I got a really great client once, and again, I've only been doing this for about two years now, having my own practice that is. Uh, where I couldn't actually help them with their legal problem, but I found them an attorney who who did, and it was a really good referral. And I got a great referral from that person because I did a good job in finding them yeah. the right person to help them. And, That's you know, I great. No quality of work. Like they can't say he he's a great attorney. He helped me solve my legal problem. They were just like I could rely on this person. Yeah. And that's all you need sometimes. Yeah, it is. It definitely yeah. so the sphere of influence thing is def, it definitely works and and who you know and who you could connect your clients to whether they're another attorney or an insurance person, financial person, whomever, huge, huge, can't be understated. Something else I want to get to because I, I mean we're just time is just being burned away in this conversation. There's so much <laughs> to cover. The, the technology. Like what was the technology yeah. like that you were using when you got started? What's oh, it like God. what's it like now? You know, and along the way, like what like what were you using? I also curious yeah. to know, like specifically with the payments and powering the subscription so you don't have to worry about account receivables. What were you doing? Yeah, so that was a that was a whole thing for me when I first so I mean I started out just saying, Okay, well I'll just use QuickBooks and I'll figure it out. And it was just it was it was a mess, right? <laughs> You know, I couldn't really, I wasn't really even tracking to figure out profitability in the beginning, to, to be honest. I kind of was just going after it and figuring, well, I can kind of gauge it on my own, how much I'm working, what I'm doing. And I wasn't really doing a lot of good numbers. Like you said, it's not a lot of data and I didn't have a good way to track it. So then I tried to buy, I bought one of the legal practice management systems. I think it was Leaf. And, you know, they sold me on it and I kept telling them, I'm like, look, it's not really set up right. I don't really think this is going to work very well for me. And they're like, no, look, we can do it this way and we'll help you implement. And, you know, I spent a bunch of money on it, total waste of money for three years until my lease was up on it. And I gave it back to them and said, thank you very little. I didn't use this basically at all. You know, it was really just, it really didn't work for me. The one thing that it led me to was LawPay, which was a great, which is a great piece of software for sending out bills and tracking bills. And and it integrates into QuickBooks. And that was my answer, right? That piece of software was really good. And then I tried to get into, then I was, I was trying to do like front end onboarding and there was a company out of Canada that I had had a piece of software and I can't remember the name of it right now, uh, but it was pretty good. Like they were trying to build out, like, you know, you would get a date, you would have a place to actually pull files in from clients and you could send, send files back in a secure platform. Uh, it was kind of clunky, but it worked mostly. And I kept thinking like, that was kind of going to be the next stage of where I was going to go. And then when that I'm, I put the firm that I merged into is the Salesforce platform, which is super interesting. Mm-hmm. So they're using Salesforce with Avalogics and accounting seed and the Salesforce and, and, uh, and document management system that attaches in as well. And you get a lot of power out of it. Like there's really, it's, it's still not, you know, look, nothing is tailored to, you know, a subscription model, right? Because it's, it's just not, nobody built it yet. No. Because you're basically building, it's a strange build, right? Because you're talking about a matter managed, we're matter managed still, right? You still have to do, we still open matters for things, even though we're a subscription overall. So it's, it's, you're, you're kind of jamming round pegs into square holes with any of the tech that's out there. So from my perspective. Uh, yeah. I mean, two, two tech uh, companies come to mind, uh, legal tech. I've had both of them yep. on the show, and, and in fact, we're going to have an episode uh, recorded live at Tech Show with, with one of them again, but Fidu Legal, F-I-D-U, like fiduciary, yep. they they were founded by a subscription billing attorney, and so they're, they're still very early. I think they're only in like year two or three, and and they are built for subscription law firms first. Now, what they, they've done a little bit of a pivot, and I, I'm excited to have this conversation with their, their founders because you know there's just not a lot of attorneys who are looking for a subscription yeah. solution. So they, they also market like we're the flat, we power your flat fees too. Okay. So, yeah. You know, so, so they're like, they are the only one that says like, this is what we do. This is all we do. And their integration partner for payments is a law pay competitor, Confido Legal, which used to be Gravity Legal. And you could. Okay. Yeah. Power, I heard, I remember Gravity. Yeah. Yeah. You could, you could power subscriptions right through there, which is really something. So if you just want a, just a payment solution, I know Confido lets you do that. I just use them for, 
for trust accounting purposes because right. I already have another integration set up. And then Rally Legal and Rally is Rally was the one that I was using for that was the Canadian company that I was using. Yeah, and now and they did Spellbook, which they is an AI based drafting tool. So so that's what, okay. I think they've even rebranded their whole company to Spellbook because it just that's okay. it took off. But yeah, but yeah, they were the other ones who they they well, well they didn't necessarily do a lot of advertising. I knew that on this aspect of it, they did have on their website if you want to do a subscription law firm, yeah. we can we could have that for you, the client portal and everything. And what I found with both these tools, because I demoed both of them, is there's less of a focus on matter management because you're when you're looking at lifetime value with your clients, it's more like this is your client for life and they will have a, a lease, they will have a this, they will have a that. And when you so it's more like when you're in house, you have like a folder and subfolders for your clients. And these matters right. might never some of these matters might never end. So I don't even necessarily categorize some things as matters because they're not like a one and done type thing. Like a closing, that might be more like a matter, right? Like a like a transactional closing. Yeah, I have a yeah, I, I kinda I kind of have it set up like five different, you know, major, you know, you have a corporate folder, you have an insurance folder, you have an HR folder, an ops folder. And you kind of have those standard matters that exist no matter what. And then you open other matters as like little things pop up that are kind of, you know, one-off things that you want to track. I don't really, I mean, from, from an accounting standpoint, from my, from my standpoint, I don't necessarily care that much. Right. <laughs> you know, whether it gets tracked down to that level, some of the clients want to see it. Most don't care. That's an interesting thing. Like when you do, you, you get a lot of clients, do you get any clients for asking you for backup billing, like no. hours to see where you're at? No, no. In fact, the the there's a handful of institutional clients that I have, though I'd say most of my clients are not, they, they've never hired a lawyer before, yeah. small business or individual people. Or if they had, it was because they had no other choice. Right. <laughs> so, so, so the institutional business clients, they, I, I had somebody in like their, one of their, one client in their accounting department, like asked for my bill. And I was like, there's one invoice and it says that it's recurring. And it was the first yeah. invoice that was paid. And then it's automated yeah. through the system. So I could show you the receipts for payments, but I don't actually invoice anymore because it's an ongoing subscription. And then I never heard from that person again. Cause that, you know, cause they have, they do hire a lot of law firms for different things. And the yeah. reason they hired me is because of the simplicity of it. And, yeah. and, and I just handle day-to-day -day things for this client and they hand, they hire big giant law firms for all the other things that they're doing as because there's there's power to those brands right so there's still yeah. there's still going to be a reason to hire a giant law firm oh um, yeah they're, they're, they yeah. exist for a reason and they will always exist yeah but but to handle you know a random employee got sued and they shouldn't have been or you know go over this termination agreement for for this particular jurisdiction you know like little things like that why should i pay a thousand dollars an hour for something like that right you should not so, 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 so no, like the whole reason they've hired me is because they're not expecting that at all. Yeah. And, and, and attorneys who still do that, I'm like, you got to move your clients away from that because it's still taking you time away from your productive day to do business development, building automations yeah. or, or doing the legal work. Right. And it's just, you know, get, get, get away from it, which, which makes me wonder, you know, what were you doing for like documents? Like, did you... Did you subscribe to document databases? Did you use any automation tools? Were you using the paper on yeah. the other side mostly? Like, what were you doing when you were getting started? Yeah, at that point, I didn't have any automation. I didn't. I hadn't. I hadn't acquired any automation tools. I was using. I mean, I ha I bought a Lexus subscription very early on. I knew I needed it. And Lexus is Lexus Advance. Their their business forms are great. Right. They're really good forms. And I kind of, I had. I'm just be. I mean, I had. You know. Or twenty some years of practice, you know, wasn't always practicing, but I was practicing for twenty years. I had everything, right? I had, I had a lot of my own forms already built out. Right. The advantage of you know being in house in the cable company for six years, I had great forms from that, right? I love the general counsel was was really good, and we built out a really great set of forms. I still had them, right? I used them all the way through my company. And tweak them and built them along the way. So they, they, I had a pretty good set of stuff to start out. And anything I didn't have, I was getting from Lexus. And you know, you you start calling on you know old friends from law school. Hey, you know, you got this. You ever done one of these? Yeah, hold on, I'm gonna shoot you something. <laughs> you just kind of build up your, you, you know, if you just build your, you know, I was using Dropbox and build up a nice form set. Yep. And you know, now now I have obviously I have a lot more access with 
OGC solutions because they're, you know, they've been around a long time and there's a lot, there's a lot, we have a lot of forms. We pretty much um, like, can't think of something we haven't seen, but you never know. Yeah. I, I mean, and even a company that size using Salesforce, I almost feel like is, it's a pretty small company to be using Salesforce. Yeah. So we, we are, we are, I would say we're, we're definitely not, we're, 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 we're trying to push the, the technology piece yeah. to the next level. So we're starting to build, we're starting to bring in the right AI tools on top of it. The advantage is, you know, there's a lot of stuff built on the Salesforce platform. Yeah. You know, it's kind of, you know, yeah, it's clunky with Salesforce and it can be clunky because they're allowed to be because they're the big behemoth, but there's some interesting things with it. I mean, I don't know that, you know, like every platform there's, you know, you can look at it and be like, oh, I could do something a whole lot better. Sure. Do you want to spend the money to do it? <laughs> right. Right. That, that's the problem. That's, that's the always ongoing problem, which is why I'm excited. Yeah. Like t tomorrow is tech show for, for those who are in or around Chicago or coming in for it for ABA tech show. So we'll see all the, I think every yeah. single exhibitor is now it's mandatory that they have some kind of AI feature that they're promoting with their tool too. Or, or, or at least they say they do. <laughs> right. I, I, I've definitely demoed some tools that even have AI in the business name, like for legal tech. Yeah. And I'm like, there is nothing ai there's about no this. ai in this <laughs> it's like well it's on Just, our product roadmap I'm yeah, like, okay yeah yeah <laughs> of course <laughs> yeah and i am on the and then on the other hand i'm demoing some amazing ai tools that are all in yeah. ai so so you know I've, I've seen i've seen both sides of it but very excited for that and any other any other technology that comes to mind that's worth mentioning whether it's stuff you're using now or things along the way that that helped you you know, reduce time you're spending on client files so you can maximize, you know, revenue with less time and all that. No, to, to me, it really is like you could use, you could find any kind of tools you want. Really, you just have to build, it's really your workflow that makes sense. I would say I thought Reality was really onto something on the front end onboarding piece of it, which was really interesting because you could build out these questionnaires. You could do it in Google Forms, right? Or, or a job form. That I think is something that, you know, any solo should be doing. You know, Google Forms, Job Form, they're easy to use. Job Form is better than Google, in my opinion, just because it's a little more secure and the database is nicer in terms of where you can put the data. And it's not complex at all. It's easy to build, easy form builders. But to build out things like, hey, you know, you want to onboard somebody, that's the stuff that, like, it just kills you from an administrative standpoint, is getting all that information in, you know, how are you going to plug it in? Where is it going to go? Getting the, re getting the, you know, getting your letter set up and having a good retainer letter and, you know, your engagement letter set up so that you actually have this stuff ready to go and fillable and just touching buttons to do it. That's huge, right? If you can get to there, you know, and build it out right now, I don't know of anybody that, like, I can't just say, hey, use this piece of software. It's kind of everybody. I think we're all kind of just glitched together. I've been looking at, you know, maybe building something on the front end, you know, like kind of like what kind of like what rally was doing, but a little, I have, I have some other thoughts on it. That's something that I think would be an interesting piece of software. Yeah. Yeah. The, the longtime listeners know sponsor of the show gavel is like a legal tech solution that does a version okay. of this. So they do, they used to be document. Maybe you've heard of document because they document was, it was around a lot longer. They rebranded yeah. as gavel. And the reason they rebranded is because, um, they, they do so much more than just document automation. Right. So they they could do the intake stuff. They could do all that, and then once you capture that data from your client or prospective client, now now it could populate these documents if you set up the automation. You know, and it does require a little bit of that. Um, I'm gonna, I'm going to have the founder back on the show to talk about how they're integrating generative AI, which which they are legitimately integrating generative AI <laughs> into <laughs> building document automations. Um, yeah. Because it's still tedious to like go in and do all the if this, then that, then this clause, then that clause, yeah. put it here, put it there. You know, it does take time and it's not like it, it, it for legal, for building automations for legal documents. I think it does require a legal mind, but you have to be comfortable going in and doing those things. Um, so, um, so with Gen AI, I, I believe they're like trying to reduce the friction of setting up those automations because you yeah. use natural language then instead of if this, then that logic to, to build those out. So, so, and, and also listen, at this point in the, you already, the listeners have heard the commercial, but just as a reminder, law subscribed saves you 10% if you sign up for an annual subscription with Gavel. Okay. So, yeah. No, so, it sounds, sounds interesting. I'd like to check it out. Yeah. Yeah, de definitely. Definitely check it out. So, yeah. and save your 10% by using the code law subscribe. So <laughs> promoting my, my show sponsors aside, we're, we're getting close on time here. I want to be respectful of your time. So let's, a few more questions are, 
Um, how did you handle, and maybe how are you handling multi-jurisdictional practice? Because especially when it's just fractional general counsel, you're not going to court. Different lawyers have different opinions, how comfortable they are doing things like that are all completely taking place outside your jurisdiction. So, you know, if it's federal law, I guess you could do it. But like, how did you handle that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable that, you know, usually representing, I mean, look, I had 90% of the time you're representing a Delaware entity and I'm not a Delaware lawyer. Right. So, you know, I have very little issue with, you know, representing clients across jurisdictions on corporate matters, you know, and, you know, find it. And if, if the matter was an employment issue or something that needed local, I would find a local counsel to do it uh, and get advice, right? Or just bring them in. You know, luckily now with part of the reason why I merged the firm, you know, we have 20 attorneys that we're, we're, we have, we have people licensed across the country, not all 50 states, but we have a lot of states covered at this point. Right. You feel really, you, your comfort level goes up a lot more. I'd say it, it's definitely an issue that the bar association needs to deal with and should have dealt with it years ago. Yeah. You know, these, these ridiculous rules that like, you know, well, if you're in-house, you know, you could practice in this state, but you need to get a waiver and blah, blah, blah. It's just like, you know, I, I think I get it for court, for going to court and you need to know local rules, but from a corporate standpoint and a contractual standpoint and day-to-day -day general counsel kind of work, I would, I, I'm not saying I push the boundaries, but yeah, yeah. I, I, I think multi-jurisdictional practice is, is just, it's natural and it's part of what you have to do. Yeah, it's one of these things where I think the proposals for some changes that I've seen say you just have to advise your client that you're not licensed in their specific yeah. jurisdiction. And as long as they understand and accept that, that then it's OK. Like that's, I think, what I've, some of the proposed changes to the model rules have said some version of that. Yeah. So kind of as long as you're doing that right now, look, there's no legal ethics provided on this podcast. Exactly. But, yeah. but you know, it's like one of these things is like, you know, disclose right make sure yeah. it's reasonable make sure you disclose and all that and yeah i mean just, you know yeah. yeah any of any of us that have been practicing for any period of time you know when you're over your skis yeah and if yeah. you're not smart enough to know when you're over your skis then you, you shouldn't be doing the you shouldn't be general counsel anyway <laughs> like honestly if, if you don't if you can't recognize those things that's the whole idea of the general counsel is recognizing when you are out of your element and you need to get some support so yes. you know when i get that when i go there i go for support Yes. Yes. Last substantive question I'd like to ask you, and let me know if you have a hard stop at the top of the hour, is how you priced it, maybe even how you're currently pricing it. Because, and you don't have to give away prices, prices change, but like, do you have set prices, tiers that they could go up? Do you have custom pricing? Yeah, I'm not using, no, I'm not using any tiers or, or, or set pricing. I price based on, I do some due diligence on the front end but at, a, at, a, at, a, at the first, at the initial meeting, and then I ask for some documents. Uh, I asked for handbooks and some other corporate documents and some things, and I know immediately where the company is. I can tell where they are in their, in their maturation sc scale. And through that, I can price accordingly. Uh, I've never been wrong, you know, knock on wood to date. One client, I actually lowered their price. I never had to raise anybody's price. Mm -hmm. I lowered a price because I realized that they were more mature than I thought they were, or, or really that they just weren't. They didn't need as much support as I thought they would. Yeah. Yeah. Gosh, you don't hear that a lot. <laughs> Attorneys lowering their yeah. prices for their clients. Yeah. It does come up on the podcast because, you know, when you think about it long term, you want to you want to keep representing this client. Yeah, I'd rather keep them around than, than you don't want to get to four or six months and they say, why have we been paying this guy? He's not doing anything. And then they cut you off completely. Rather right. call them proactively and say, hey, you know, you know, it doesn't look like you're using them that much service. You know, I think we should drop your price down. I still think there's a lot of value that I can add here. Let's see if this works. Yeah. Yeah. So the last question I'm going to ask you is a question I ask all my guests and why people stick around to the end of the show. And that is, is a hot dog a sandwich and why? Oh, it's a hot dog a sandwich. I don't eat hot dogs, but yeah, I, I believe it is a sandwich. Why? It is, it is meat within, within, within two pieces of bread. Accordingly, it's a sandwich to me. And you can put condiments on it and other stuff. Okay. All right. And did you say, did you say you were in, you're in Philadelphia or, or where are you? Yeah. Yeah. I'm so, in the Philly area. You're in the Philly area. So is a Philly cheesesteak a sandwich? A hundred percent. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you said that so confidently. I don't need an explanation as to why. <laughs> That's right. 
<laughs> if people wanted to follow up with you, what's the best way for them to do that? You know, you could find me at MarkSniderman.com is, is easy. Uh, on the OGC Solutions website, OGCSolutions.com, Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, TikTok, at Mark Snyderman. I'm, I'm pretty much ubiquitous everywhere. Yeah, and that's Mark with a C for those who are- It is who Mark with a C, that is correct. Who didn't, if you didn't actually read the, the name of the podcast that has his name in it, it's Mark with a C. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank uh, you. Well, thank, again, thanks so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks so much. And that's our show. Thanks again to 650 and Gavel for being sponsors. The best way for others to discover this show is for you to share it with somebody you think would find value from it. Follow me on LinkedIn since that's where I'm most active on social media and click the bell towards the top right of my profile to get notified about all of my posts about this podcast and everything else I think is valuable for you to see. To get in touch, message me on LinkedIn or email kerbis at lawsubscribed.com. All links are in the show notes. Until next time, this is Matthew Kerbis with Law Subscribed. Subscribed.